Edie Lutnick is the author of An Unbroken Bond, the untold story of how the 658 Cantor Fitzgerald families faced the tragedy of 9-11 and beyond. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much, Steve. It's an honor to have you here. It is an untold story about um, something people think they know a lot about. Uh, they hear Cantor Fitzgerald. They don't. They, they, wasn't that the firm down in uh, uh, World Trade Center and terrible things happened? You're very directly connected to that firm. Um, it's a family connection. Describe it. So um, my brother Howard is the chairman and the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald. My brother Gary was a senior executive at Cantor. I was a labor lawyer mm. on September the 10th. My brother Howard had given me space in their offices, which were the 101st to the 105th floor of One World Trade Center. And um, my brother Gary, unfortunately, on September 11th was at work along with 657 of his friends and colleagues who were above the impact of the plane. And so they all perished. And so on September the 13th, my brother Howard said, uh, Edie, I want to start a charity to take care of these families, and I'd like you to run it. And One, so, just right immediately? Immediately, within uh, 48 hours. You know, the firm was in rubble. Maybe 200 people that my brother had hired personally had perished, including his best friend. We didn't know how many people we had lost. Initially, we thought it was going to be well over 800. And we, uh, but my brother knew that he wanted to help these families. And I learned very quickly that, you know, if, if these people were in the kind of pain that I was in, because mm -hmm. we had lost our parents young, and so I raised my brother Gary. You raised him. I raised him. So he was my brother, but he was also like my child. And so if, if other families were in the kind of pain that I was in, I had to try to help them. And so we started the relief fund uh, to take care of the families that lost loved ones on 9 that, That's actually a picture of, of you behind you, a picture of you and your brother. Yeah. Wasn't he handsome? Very handsome. <laughs> Very handsome. Here's what a lot of us, I'm sure, are trying to make sense of. You're dealing with this extraordinary, unbelievable, hard to imagine personal tragedy. But then your brother Howard says, and we want you to lead this effort. How is it that you step back and get the perspective, the strength, the courage to do what it is you have been doing all this time, particularly back then? You know, I, I, that, that's actually a very difficult question to answer. I mean, do you even know the answer? Probably not. I mean, we had lost our parents when we were younger. And, and so because of that loss, and our, our family was not there for us, the, the family surrounding us. And so we relied very heavily on each other. And we knew, you know, the way that Howard puts it is we knew what hell looked like. That's you and Howard right there. And we wanted, yeah. Yeah. And we wanted other families to not have to go through what we went through if there was any way that we could make it easier for them. And the irony is that I think by helping these families, through the Cantor Fitzgerald Relief Fund and coming up with a model um, that worked to help them heal and took a sea of strangers and turned them into a community, it not only helped them, but it helped me. How? Because I think that in the face of tragedy, whether it's personal or public or you know large or small, that the reality is that if you can find something larger than yourself to focus on, it will not only help you heal, but you will be able to do great things in the world. And I think by focusing on the Cantor Fitzgerald Relief Fund, which was going to take care of these families, it allowed me to really uh, look at something larger than just my own grief. And, and that was something that we found over and over again that works. There are um, hundreds and hundreds of philanthropic organizations that have come out of the 9-11 community not to address the issues of 9-11, but to address the problems of the world. Right. And dedicating themselves to those type of endeavors uh, have really, really has allowed our, our families to heal. The fund that was created to help those families to create this family, this bigger family, what did most of those, what do most of those families need? What have they needed for all these years? You know, it was very interesting. So, in this country, we used to give out services. If you were below the poverty line, you could get a financial distribution, but otherwise we tried to figure out what the services were. 
And we learned very quickly that every family actually needs different things. Everybody mm. processes grief differently. Everybody goes through tragedy and trauma differently. And you need different things for your family. And so what we decided was that we were going to give money directly to each family. I wasn't going to play Solomon. I wasn't going to decide what each family needed. I was going to give each family the money so that they could decide what was right for them. Because maybe you needed to send your child to camp Maybe you needed to hold your child as close as you possibly could. Maybe you needed therapy. Maybe you needed to get out of town. So maybe you needed to pay your bills. Maybe you needed et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So every family needed something different. And so we said, you know what? Every life is precious. Every life is equal. We're going to give the same amounts of money. We're going to raise the money. Cantor Fitzgerald made a commitment they were going to give 25% of their profits for five years and 10 years of health care. And that ultimately resulted in $180 million to our 658 families. $180 million dollars for 658 families. Yeah. That'll, that'll help make a family tighter. And you know what? The thing for me was that, you know, 9-11 is the backdrop for the story. But the thing about 9-11 and the thing about my book, An Unbroken Bond, and it's, it's a larger story than that. Mm. It's what are the things that we can learn from what happened in 9-11 so that we can apply it going forward in the way that we look at what our behavior was. What were the obstacles that the 9-11 families faced? How did we behave as individuals, as corporations, as communities, as politicians, as governments, as societies, as religions? What did we do? What, did we, what can we learn from this? What can we take away? You know, it's so interesting to me that it, I, I knew about you, the work you were doing, but our mutual friend, Annette Catino, over in New Jersey. She's the best. Um, she's a board member of, of our production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation. And, they recommend guests, and she recommended you. She's a CEO who thinks about leadership a lot. And she said this was in many ways about a lot of things, but also about leadership, right? I think so. How I'm, is this about leadership? You know, I, I think that we had to be entrepreneurial. Mm. I think that Canna Fitzgerald and the Canna Fitzgerald Relief Fund are a story about a company and a charity that were married around a single mission. And that mission was to take care of these families any way that they possibly could. And that we then looked to what the families needed and we took our agenda from that. Because what happens a lot of times is that people don't listen. They don't actually listen to what it is that the people who are in need need. But they decide for they them. They decide for them. And we said we're not going to do that. And so we created this model, whether it was how we gave our money out directly and we looked outside the box to be able to do that. So if you called and you had a problem, we knew that that problem applied to so many other people that we needed to chase that down. So you had a 14-year-old who was putting his fist through a wall because he was being killed with kindness because everyone was saying, you're the man of the family now. Because he lost you his dad. You need to take care of your mother. Because his dad's gone. Correct. You need to be strong for her. And so he's reacting with anger because he has no place to express his grief. Mm. And we sat back and said, right, mm. we need to find programs where 14-year-olds can do martial arts. So no matter what it was, the financial part of it, sure, but it was looking at the person as a whole and running that down and then trying to say, okay, how can we apply this to other charities and disasters? Why did you decide to write this book? You know, um, I gave a speech. Uh, you give a lot of speeches. I do. People ask I, you to, to come and talk to them, and they so do. they're looking for inspiration and, and strength, and Thank they you. expect you to give it. I, you By the way, what? before you go any further, describe what you have right there. Oh, my heart. Um, so the first time I ever actually gave a, a speech, my first real public speech was actually my brother Gary's memorial service. And at my memorial service, I said that my heart was in three pieces. One third of it was mine to do with what I wanted, and I gave that to Lewis, who's my other half. One third belonged to my brother Howard, and one third, which is broken but never severed, belonged to my brother Gary. 
And Lewis is an artist, and so he made me my broken heart, which I wear all the time. And sometimes what we've learned is that it takes a broken heart to heal a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And so my ability and Howard's ability to understand what our families needed uh, was huge. And once we were able to get them to a place where, where they were stable, we started thinking about what was their legacy. And so one of the things that that I speak about when I go and I give speeches, of course, both on you know an unbroken bond and about Canner's story and our story, but on resilience, on how you get through a trauma and a tragedy. Because the reality is, I'm here. I'm here. Mm. And this happened to me, and I was just a person. And you know, and it's about leadership, and it's about thinking outside of the box, and how you can help people, and what you can do in your own community. You know, one of the things that that we've now looked at is. Um, By the way, excuse me. I want to make sure, sure. I let folks know you vet websites. That you I let do have know. websites. Uh, put that up. The information there. What, that part. I don't. Wanna, I, I know we're running out of time, but I want to make sure you get a chance to say that. How do you let people know who does what and? And, and okay, so we have, we have two websites. Yes. So we have uh, www.cannerrelief.org where you can donate to the Canner Fitzgerald Relief Fund. And right. our projects are that we give direct financial aid to victims of terrorism, natural disasters, and emergencies. So we gave uh, a $10 million program in Sandy. We went into Oklahoma after the tornado. We're helping the victims' families from Sandy Hook as they approach their one-year anniversary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We also, in addition to that, have started a website called IHaveNeverHeardOfYou.com. That was up there too. Go ahead. Because one of the things that seconds. I've learned in my speaking is that people don't know about the grassroots charities in their area that do great works. And so this website is going to try to give a voice to those charities because 86% of our charitable dollars only go to 1% of the charities. Yeah, I wish we had more time. Because, Me too. Um, because not only do you have more to say, but we have more to learn. But I cannot thank you enough. Uh, the book is called An Unbroken Bond, and we have a bond with you, and I cannot thank you for joining our public television family.